2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, and perhaps a few of the following verses. Listen to me now as I read the words of eternal life. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed, our trouble on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our flesh. So then death is working in us, but life in you. Help me, say, if you will, an imperishable commodity in a perishable vessel. An uh, imperishable, indestructible, inerrant, eternal, all wise, all knowing, uh, far reaching commodity has somehow been placed in a perishable vessel that is frail, uh, fragile, dying, corruptible, errant, God has chosen to place an imperishable commodity in a perishable vessel. He has chosen to put that which is indestructible, uh, eternal, life-giving into that which daily encounters failure, error, mistakes, decay. In fact, this text is perhaps one of the divine paradoxes of the great I Am. Because when you juxtapose the perishable to that which is perishable, it does not make sense that God Almighty, Elohim, El Shaddai, El Elyon, would somehow place the best that he has in the worst that he made and then give us that awful responsibility of transmitting those unsuchable eternal truths to those whose lives are in shambles, that are frail, decrepit, full of errors and mistakes, but yet God, which seems to be a little bit paradoxical, would trust his eternal riches and to people who have not been faithful, who've not been honest, who've erred continually from the plan of salvation. We've studied the Apostle Paul. We know something about the history of his life, his theology, his philosophical orientation because he was deeply steeped in Greek philosophy and Hebrew theology. He was a Roman by citizenship. He was a Jew by relationship. He was a Pharisee by membership. Here was a man who was diverse in his training and his experience uh, 
who had uh, set himself to become one of the great leaders of ancient Israel, or perhaps uh, the leader of the Sanhedrin Council, because he had sat at the feet of Gamaliel and Hillel and had subscribed to the Hebraic teachings of his day, and he had graduated uh, summa cum laude. He had the phylacteries of the law, and the skirts of his garment, and had them over his forehead. So he was prepared academically and theologically to transmit to the world the intricate tenets of Hebrew religion. Paul was perhaps able to speak seven languages fluently so he could preach the gospel on Mars Hill as well as he could uptown Jerusalem because his academic exposure had prepared him for those tasks. Here was the uh, Apostle Paul who became uh, perhaps the greatest theologian of Christianity because of his familiarity with Hellenistic Greek and Alexander the Great, he was fluent in he Greek. So it was he, not Peter, James, and John, who was able uh, to take the message of the Jesus of history and transmit it to that intellectual, uh, philosophical Greek mind on uh, the European continent. Here he was, he was able uh, to take the basic tenets of what Judaism was about and the understanding of what Christianity was about and then put it in the theological vocabulary of those on Mars Hill. And so he was perhaps one of the best minds that the Hebrew nation had produced. But he had a rendezvous one day with the Jesus about whom he knew nothing, but oh, my God, when he met Jesus, his words was, what will thou have me to do? The text today is one of uh, the works of the genius of Paul. Uh, John was not able to do this. And, but here is Paul who took the gospel uh, of Jesus Christ for the first time from the Asia minor continent over into Europe. Man met him from Macedonia, said, come over. And Macedonia and help us. Paul took the gospel from Asia into Europe and the Philippi and preached out that great church in Philippi. And Paul appreciated the quality of the gospel. You see, you, you, you've been given a, 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 a quality product. And uh, it's amazing to me that Paul was able uh, to stand uh, on the isthmus, that little strip of land uh, that divided the Peloponnese area from the rest of the world where the ships would come in the harbor, pick up their goods and take them to the other parts of the world. Paul puts that into theological language and uh, he says that as uh, the ships come into harbor, from other parts of the world and pick up cargo, they pick up cargo that much more valuable than the ship its own. Are y'all with me here today? The cargo that's on the ship from Corinth to the rest of the world is more expensive than the ship that carries it. So Paul was able to use that cultural, economic, reality and put it into the theological language of the church of his day. Inasmuch as God, uh, old man God, that uh, created 
the world ex nihilo and stoop down and meticulously form the man out of the dust of the earth and then breathe into his nostrils the Hebrew says ruah breathe into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a nephesh hayah or a living breathing thing directly from God that's the God I'm talking about who sent his son Jesus to a lost, decrepit, sinful world and then gave him the authority to lead us from the gloomy darkness of our past over in the holiness upon the king's highway. Well, Jesus did something here on earth Jesus showed us how to get to God. He showed us that our estrangement did not have to be permanent. That our broken relationship could come back together. Oh, my God, I'm trying to feel my way here because I don't know how you Georgia folk respond, you know. Yeah, and uh, the potter somehow brought us back together again. And so this quality of message, Jesus transmitted to the church, said to them in Matthew 28, go into all the world. And I, I, I have concerns about that rendering of that text because when we think of going in the old world we think about a 747 get on the 747 at Hartsfield Airport and we go to sleep and wake up when we get in Europe then we get up and preach but in Jesus' day there were no 747s uh, so rather than Jesus said, go into all the world, he said, as you go, preach the gospel. No, no, not a gospel, but the gospel. Don't preach Paul Tillich's method of correlation. Don't preach Socrates, know thyself. Don't preach Roman, control yourself. But preach... The gospel. And uh, the gospel uh, is that euangelion, the good news that Jesus has brought to the world. Well, uh, I want you to preach it like I said preach it. And the only ship that I have to get it from America to Europe is an old broken down vessel who is a former drug addict, a former pimp or prostitute, a former gambler and a midnight rambler. That, that, that's the only ship I got. And I want to, I'm, I'm going to take this gospel and I'm going to put it on that ship. The ship might go down but the word is going on. Yeah. We have this gospel. We have that transforming power of the world in an old broken down, <laughs> broken down cargo ship. But that's all I have. And if you fail, I have no other option. Oh, my God. Well, why would God put such valuable commodity on an invaluable, decrepit ship? Well, uh, he's more concerned about the quality of the product 
than he is the quantity of the delivery system. 